Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Garanger July 19th, St. Vincent de Paul, Confessor Vincent was a man of faith that worketh by charity. At the time he came into the world, at the close of the same century in which Calvin was born, the church was mourning over the many nations separated from the faith. The Turks were harassing all the coasts of the Mediterranean. France, worn out by forty years of religious strife, was shaking off the yoke of heresy from within, while by a foolish stroke of policy she gave it external liberty. The eastern and northern frontiers were suffering the most terrible devastations, and the west and the center were the scene of civil strife and anarchy. In this state of confusion, the condition of souls was still more lamentable. In the towns alone was there any sort of quiet, any possibility of prayer. The country people, forgotten, sacrificed, and subject to the utmost miseries, had none to support and direct them but a clergy too often abandoned by their bishops, unworthy of the ministry, and well-nigh as ignorant as their flocks. Vincent was raised up by the Holy Spirit to obviate all these evils. The world admires the works of the humble shepherd, but it knows not the secret of their vitality. Philanthropy would imitate them, but its establishments of today are destroyed tomorrow, like castles built by children in the sand, while the institution it would fain supersede remains strong and unchanged, the only one capable of meeting the necessities of suffering humanity. The reason of this is not far to seek. Faith alone can understand the mystery of suffering, having penetrated its secret in the passion of our Lord. And charity that would be stable must be founded on faith. Vincent loved the poor because he loved the God whom his faith beheld in them. O oh God, he used to say, it does us good to see the poor, if we look at them in the light of God, and think of the high esteem in which Jesus Christ holds them. Often enough they have scarcely the appearance or the intelligence of reasonable beings, so rude and earthly are they. But look at them by the light of faith, and you will see that they represent the Son of God, who chose to be poor. He in his passion had scarcely the appearance of a man. He seemed to the Gentiles to be a fool, and to the Jews a stumbling block. Moreover, he calls himself the Evangelist of the Poor. This title of Evangelist of the Poor is one that Vincent ambitioned for himself, the starting point in the explanation of all that he did in the church. His one aim was to labor for the poor and the outcast. All the rest, he said, was but secondary. It is time to give the full account which Holy Church reads today in her liturgy. We will only remind our readers that in the year 1883, the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the St. Vincent de Paul Conferences at Paris, the Sovereign Pontiff Leo XIII proclaimed our saint the patron of the Societies of Charity in France. Vincent de Paul, a Frenchman, from his boyhood was remarkable for his exceeding charity towards the poor. As a child he fed his father's flock, but afterwards he pursued the study of humanities. Having been ordained priest, he took his degree as Bachelor of Theology, but falling into the hands of the Turks was led captive by them into Africa. While in captivity he won his master back to Christ by the help of the Mother of God, and escaped together with him from that land of barbarians, and undertook a journey to the shrines of the apostles. On his return to France, he governed in a most saintly manner the parishes first of Clichy and then of Châtillon. The king next appointed him chaplain of the French galleys, and marvelous was his zeal in striving for the salvation of both officers and convicts. St. Francis of Sales gave him as a superior to his nuns of the visitation, whom he ruled for forty years with such prudence as to amply justify the opinion the holy bishop had expressed of him, that Vincent was the most worthy priest he knew. He devoted himself with unwearying zeal, even in extreme old age, to preaching to the poor, especially to country people. And to this apostolic work he bound both himself and the members of the congregation which he founded, called the Secular Priests of the Mission, by a special vow which the Holy See confirmed. He labored greatly in promoting regular discipline among the clergy, as is proved by the seminaries for clerics which he built, and by the establishment through his care of frequent conferences for priests, and of exercises preparatory to holy orders. It was his wish that the houses of his institution should always lend themselves to these good works, 
as also to the giving of pious retreats for laymen. Moreover, with the object of extending the reign of faith and love, he sent evangelical laborers not only into the French provinces, but also into Italy, Poland, Scotland, Ireland, and even to Barbary and to the Indies. On the demise of Louis the Thirteenth, whom he had assisted on his deathbed, he was made a member of the Council of Conscience by Queen Anne of Austria, mother of Louis the Fourteenth. In this capacity he was most careful that only worthy men should be appointed to ecclesiastical and monastic benefices, and strove to put an end to civil discord and duels, and to the errors then creeping in, which had alarmed him as soon as he knew of their existence. Moreover, he endeavored to enforce upon all a due obedience to the judgments of the apostolic see. His paternal love brought relief to every kind of misfortune. The faithful groaning under the Turkish yoke, destitute children, incorrigible young men, virgins exposed to danger, nuns driven from their monasteries, fallen women, convicts, sick strangers, invalidated workmen, even madmen and innumerable beggars. All these he aided and received with tender charity into his hospitable institutions which still exist. When Lorraine, Campania, Picardy, and other districts were devastated by pestilence, famine, and war, he supplied their necessities with open hand. He founded other associations for seeking out and aiding the unfortunate, amongst others the celebrated Society of Ladies, and the now widespread institution of the Sisters of Charity. To him is also due the foundation of the Daughters of the Cross, of Providence, and of St. Genevieve, who are devoted to the education of girls. Amid all these and other important undertakings, his heart was always fixed on God. He was affable to everyone, and always true to himself, simple, upright, humble. He ever shunned riches and honors, and was heard to say that nothing gave him any pleasure except in Christ Jesus, whom he strove to imitate in all things. Worn out at length by mortifications of the body, labors, and old age, on the 27th of September, in the year of salvation, 1660, in the 85th year of his age, he peacefully fell asleep at Paris, at saint Lazare, the mother-house of the congregation of the mission. His virtues, merits, and miracles having made his name celebrated, Clement the Twelfth enrolled him among the saints, assigning for his annual feast the 17th of July. Leo the Thirteenth, at the request of several bishops, declared and appointed this great hero of charity, who has deserved so well of the human race, the peculiar patron before God of all the charitable societies existing throughout the Catholic world, and of all such as may hereafter be established. How full a sheaf dost thou bear, O Vincent! as thou ascendest, laden with blessings from earth to thy true country. O thou, the most simple of men, though living in an age of splendors, thy renown far surpasses the brilliant reputation which fascinated thy contemporaries. The true glory of that century, and the only one that will remain to it when time shall be no more, is to have seen in its earlier part saints powerful alike in faith and love, stemming the tide of Satan's conquests, and restoring to the soil of France made barren by heresy the fruitfulness of its brightest days. And now, two centuries and more after thy labors, the work of the harvest is still being carried on by thy sons and daughters, aided by new assistants who also acknowledge thee for their inspirer and father. Thou art now in the kingdom of heaven, where grief and tears are no more. Yet day by day thou still receivest the grateful thanks of the suffering and the sorrowful. Reward our confidence in thee by fresh benefits. No name so much as thine inspires respect for the church in our days of blasphemy. And yet those who deny Christ now go so far as to endeavor to stifle the testimony which the poor have always rendered to him on thy account. Wield against these ministers of hell the two-edged sword, wherewith it is given to the saints to avenge God in the midst of their nations. Treat them as thou didst the heretics of thy day. Make them either deserve pardon or suffer punishment, be converted or be reduced by heaven to the impossibility of doing harm. Above all, take care of the unhappy beings whom these satanic men deprive of spiritual help in their last moments. Elevate thy daughters to the high level required by the present sad circumstances, 
when men would have their devotedness to deny its divine origin and cast off the guise of religion. If the enemies of the poor man can snatch from his deathbed the sacred sign of salvation, no rule, no law, no power of this world or the next can cast out Jesus from the soul of the Sister of Charity or prevent his name from passing from her heart to her lips. Neither death nor hell, neither fire nor flood can stay him, says the Canticle of Canticles. Thy sons, too, are carrying on thy work of evangelization, and even in our days their apostolate is crowned with the diadem of sanctity and martyrdom. Uphold their zeal, develop them in thine own spirit of unchanging devotedness to the Church and submission to the Supreme Pastor. Forward all the new works of charity springing out of thy own, and placed by Rome to thy credit and under thy patronage. May they gather their heat from the divine fire which thou didst rekindle on the earth. May they ever seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, never deviating in the choice of means, from the principle thou didst lay down for them, of judging, speaking, and acting, exactly as the eternal wisdom of God, clothed in our weak flesh, judged, spoke, and acted.